Well, on this episode of Rethink Real Estate, I have the pleasure of speaking with Gary Johnson. Gary runs a marketing company that he specializes in taking people through the journey of the brand. Now, Again, we've had some individual agents within our own company where he's gone through and identified their brand. He's also gone through his his whole structure of what we go through on this episode. He's been very generous with being incredibly upfront. He's also taken us through a little bit of his experience with attorneys as well. It's another field that he works on with the brand journey. But realistically, not only do we speak about marketing, we also speak about the networking side of the business. Gary is somebody that is, as you'll see, a very charismatic individual. We speak about about, you know, what are the pitfalls of going down the networking side of things? I really don't like networking, to be honest with you. And some of the stuff that he said has really helped me individually and some offline conversations with Gary around, you know, the embracing of it a little bit further. Um, but either way, we also talk about Gary's journey through alcoholism and um, being sober. Uh, that is something that uh, that he has been open and honest with. A great episode that goes in many different ways. There is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to not only the marketing side of your business, but also the networking side of your business as well that we all take for granted a little bit. I definitely believe that. So hope you enjoy this wine ranging conversation with Gary Johnson. Welcome to Rethink Real Estate. My name is Ben Brady, and this is a real estate podcast aimed to deliver sales strategies, marketing tips, and business insights from industry experts and myself to build a listing-focused business for the future. Let's get into it. Gary, welcome to uh, Rethink Real Estate. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So you've been a referral from uh, some previous guests of ours, uh, Kathy and Brenner, um, yeah. who you know very well, uh, but, yeah. uh, but you've helped them along their journey from a marketing perspective and anybody that's paid attention to Kathy and Brenner's uprising, um, you know, in the real estate community and also obviously the communities that they're in. I think that there's something to do with what you've done with them behind the scenes yeah. and the advice they've taken from you. So we're really happy to have you on today. No, I, I have to give it all the credit to them. I mean, really, it's taking um, plans and strategies and executing it. And they are executors and they're fireballs, both of them. They're just, they're amazing human beings. Um, and I'm so grateful that they're doing extremely well. So you run a marketing consulting company. That's the first step in all of this so that everybody understands that. But that said is that Give me the uh, give me the Gary elevator pitch. I want to hear where it started, oh, wh- how you got oh. into it. This is good. This is the juicy part. <laughs> so I am uh, from Mississippi. I'm kidding. Um, no, no. I mean, um, the short answer to all of this is um, I was born and raised here in Orange County, Mission Viejo, actually, to be very specific, and um, haven't ever gone away. Went to college at Long Beach State, but actually lived in Huntington Beach. So I kind of just kept that Orange County roots. And um, as I was going through my career, I had two um, different jobs. One was right out of college working with Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And I was actually with them for nine years, um, which is for anybody who's ever worked at Enterprise, it is a lifetime. And the reason why is because you're dealing with the general public, just like real estate agents are, you know, you are dealing with the highs and lows. You're dealing with those people that are unreasonable and some people that are just, they get it. They're wonderful, wonderful to work with. And it really got me um, to where my next level was, which was director of marketing for a commercial finance company, dealing a lot with numbers, dealing a lot with cold calling or having a a team of cold callers. And um, after running that Uh, company for 12 years. I wanted equity. They didn't want to give me equity. So what did I do? I got a coach, which, you know, I am a coach and I love coaches, still have two coaches, but I wanted to help people build their book of business. I wanted to show them it's not that difficult to actually bring in business as long as you do it the right way. And I did not feel like we were doing it the right way at the commercial finance company. And I wanted to change that. Um, even though I love the people there, the owner is one of my very dear friends, but I just saw a better way. And so for the last almost nine years, I've been doing J2 marketing and working with people one-on-one to show them how to build um, a really good, robust book of business uh, for themselves. I think that 
I don't, I didn't expect the commercial financing to then go to marketing. I just, I like yeah. that. That seems a little, a bit of a, it's not a, it's not an, a common shift, so to speak. No. Um, so, so as it comes down to it, I guess that what did you take away from the commercial financing element into the marketing world and, and, and what did you get from that and what made you progress into the marketing side of it? What happened was I saw all the different things that we could do marketing wise. And, and um, one of the things that I'm very good at is putting together plans and strategies that will grab attention and will be authentic and then enables a conversation with somebody. And um, what I found was I really gravitated towards relationship marketing. And I think relationship marketing is good for certain people. It's not good for all industries. Like people are like, oh, this should be for everybody. You know, and I hate when marketing agencies say that when they say SEO is the best thing to do. If you're not having SEO, you shouldn't be in business. And I'm like, that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. Because what I found was that the people who charge a lot of money for their services have to be great at relationship marketing. And the reason why is because if you take a, um, uh, somebody who is purchasing, wants to purchase a $10 million home. Do you think they Google that person? No. They ask, who do you know? Because this is enormous. It's an enormous thing. Now, if you're selling a widget, yeah, SEO, great. Like those are fantastic. But when you are charging a lot of money for your services, it's all based on trust and it's based on likability and it's based on somebody actually knowing who the heck you are. And that's where marketing really comes into play. I think that, you know, segueing into your current business and what you're doing at the moment, you're dealing with real estate professionals, you're dealing with attorneys, correct? Um, correct. Uh, what, are yep. the, what, are some of the, what are some of the other avenues that you're sort of helping people with marketing? So when you say avenues, are you talking about other industries? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, other industries are uh, financial advisors and also insurance. Um, whether it is health insurance, um, or I have uh, one client who sells life insurance. Um, and so again, it's about relationships. Um, and so people ask me all the time, they're like, Hey, I know you help these people out, but you could help me. Like, could you do this? And it's always, it depends. Tell me who your target market is. And mm -hmm. when I can understand who your target market is, it makes things a whole lot easier to work with them or not work with them. Because I would actually say it's usually about 40% of the time when I have a conversation with somebody who has been referred over to me, I can't work with them. I just can't. Um, and um, is a that good because example they're, they're, they're indecisive around who their target market is? No, no, it's, it's actually who their target market is. Um, oh. Give you an example. I had a family law attorney from Florida who was referred over to me. And we had a conversation this morning and I told her, we can't help you. And the reason why is because she helps, and this is nothing against what she's doing, right? But she helps low income individuals to separate. It's a very easy divorce. It's, it's very simple. And so she's trying to do volume and have her associates do all the work because they can. And I mean, and it's, and it's a great service. And I said, you know what? I'm not right for you. However, I do have somebody who is right for you and I'm going to refer them over to, to you, which I did as soon as we got off that call is just refer them because, you know, I'm not everything to everybody and I can't help everybody out. I also have what I call a red velvet rope policy where I only allow certain people through. And one of my biggest, biggest things is I have to like the people I work with. Uh, because I've made that mistake before where I needed the money. And I'm like, oh, God, if you've got a checkbook and a heartbeat, I'm in. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I can change them any day. And what happened was I absolutely disliked working with them. But even worse than that was I wasn't as sharp. I wasn't as good. I wasn't giving it my all. And that, to my integrity, hurt me. Um, so much so, there was um, one client who I gave him a full refund back. We had only been working for almost a month, and I'm like, I got to give this back to you. Like, I cannot work with you. He was, he was just a really, really bad, bad attorney. And and I said, look, I just can't do it. Um, and from that point on, 
I said, it doesn't make a difference how much money I need. I have to work with people I like so that I can give them the best service so that I can really work with them. Because when I work with them, I get to know them really well. Um, And when you get to know them, you get to know what they hate and what they're horrible at. And also what do they love and what are they strong at? And we focus only on what are they strong at and what they love. Um, And there's so many things that you can do in marketing that we can fit a ton of stuff into that arena um, as opposed to, well, let's just make it so you're a little bit better than horrible, you know, on your weaknesses. And, and quite frankly, who really likes to work on their weaknesses? They just don't. I mean, they really don't. They would rather spend time on what they love to do. And so what they'll also do is neurologically, if they're working on their weakness, they will self-sabotage themselves. And they'll say, see, I told you it didn't work have that early on in my coaching where I try and teach people how to network correctly. And they go, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work. And I'm like, ah, I thought this was going to be really good. Well, what was happening is they were self-sabotaging themselves because I went with them to a network and I'm like, wait, what are you doing? Like, this isn't what we talked about because they hated it. And they, they just gravitated towards what they knew and what was comfortable with for them, even though it wasn't very profitable for them. Um, so it was an interesting dynamic to change. That's a really, I think that there, there's some real gems in all of that, but the thing that I want to, I want to dive into a little bit deeper, Gary, that let's say that I'm, a, I'm in real estate, I'm an attorney, I'm, I'm somebody right. That, uh, that you've chosen that, okay, I could probably work with you. What's yep. your process? Is your process different per industry or is it, or, or what is the process that you take them through? Um, if you can give us sort of a bit of an insight to that, then we'll drill down a little bit more in specifics about real estate, but I'd love to understand sure. the process. Yeah. So the process in and of itself is we meet on a regular basis. Um, and what we do is I, I say there is a four prong approach that I work with. We first start out with foundational. Um, And when I talk about foundational, I'm talking about personal branding. I'm talking about messaging. How are you telling stories? Um, How are you coming across to the world out there? And the reason why we start with that as opposed to working on strategies is because it gives strategies power. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I'll give you a, for instance, if we talked about networking and I I was like, Ben, this is what we're going to do on networking. We're going to do da, 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 da. You're like, okay, you execute on it. But you don't know how to talk about yourself. You don't know how to ask questions. You don't even have a personal brand. You're just kind of showing up and just winging it. So when people are having a conversation with you, you don't know what stories to tell. You don't know what stories not to tell, right? And so so it's- it's, I think that's a clear point. I think that's a really good point, Gary. What stories not to tell? (laughs) Yes. And I always get in trouble with this. Like if Kathy and Brenna are listening, they're like, you tell many a stories you shouldn't be telling, you know, um, because they get me in trouble. I mean, um, on podcasts like this, I try never to swear, but I've got the worst mouth ever. Oh, um, hey, I, everybody's <laughs> like, oh, I don't know. I think Ben could top you. I'm pretty bad myself. Oh, <laughs> challenge accepted then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah so, so we start with that foundational stuff because, again, when we're talking about referral strategies or networking strategies or social media strategies, if you don't have a personal brand, if you don't know really who's your target market, what do you, what, what, um, why do they buy your services? What are the benefits that your clients receive by working with you? You're not going to be as good. You're just going to be out there and kind of get kind of flailing around. You'll know what to do, but you'll go, there's something disjointed. So we really have to make sure that that foundational stuff is strong. Then we work into strategies. And that's when I'm working with them, not only teaching them, not only developing a specific plan for them, but then having them implement it, which is the next one, which is accountability. I hold my clients accountable. We say, okay, what are you agreeing upon? Let's say this week, I'm going to do this. Okay, great. Then the next week, okay, did you do that? If you didn't, why? What's going on? Because a strategy is only good if you actually implement it. If it's just a piece of paper, it's worthless. I mean, look, there's more books written on sales and marketing than almost any other subject out there. So why does everybody struggle, right? Because they don't implement it. They don't try it. And that accountability really comes into play so that they can, they can, you know, skin their knees, 
They can be like, oh my God, I, I got beat up. I, I went to this networking event. I got the crap kicked out of me. Great. Let's talk about it. I shouldn't say great. It's not great. Uh, but let's, <laughs> no, let's but it talk builds about character. It builds yeah. character. I get it. It does. It does. And then the fourth element is the coaching aspect. And that is being able to take them and help them overcome their limiting beliefs. We all have limiting beliefs. And so what I try to do is tackle what are those limiting beliefs when it comes to business development and marketing? Um, because we all have it. Well, I can't do this. I'm not this. I'm not that. And how do we overcome those limiting beliefs? I'll give you an example. Um, I had one of my clients. She felt like she was extremely unattractive. Right. She was like, I'm ugly. I'm ugly. So I don't go out networking. <clears throat> and, but my God, she was like, a, a, I, she had so much fire in her. She was extremely eloquent in how she communicated with people. She could carry on a conversation like that. It was so, it was so wonderful to see that, but she was so in her head. And so we developed a networking strategy because I was like, this is your strength. You just need to get over this. And I go, and somebody who has, you know, this, that I can't make money on my face, so I have to make money other ways because I'm not a model. <laughs> but I said, look, when you're networking, make it about everybody else. She said, what do you mean? I go, make it about how you can figure out what makes them successful. How can you help them be successful? Who in your network could you introduce them to? What value could you add them? Instead of, what am I going to say? How am I going to look? Am I going to be? It's all internal stuff that we do when we're networking, and yet we don't come across as our best selves because you're taking it or you're trying to build a relationship and you're making it into a transaction. And that's a horrible thing. And I think that that is what most people, most people when they're networking, um, do it that way. They go for a transaction. Who am I going to meet that's going to help me out? How can I put my pitch just right so I can keep the attention on me and, and tell stories that makes the attention on me and keep the conversation as long as I possibly can? And I said, that's a horrible idea because that's a transaction. That's what you would do if you're selling a widget. But if you're trying to build a relationship, you need to make it all about them, um, all about them. And, um, and it goes back to um, you and I had talked about this before, is the power of importance. When you're networking and you're making the other person feel important, what's happening is they are having good feelings about you. You're memorable. You know, you, you try to get rid of the narcissist that you come across. Why? Because it's all about them. You're like, they're selfish. So what do you do? You forget about them. Whereas the other person, it's all about you. You're like, oh, I really like this person. They use yeah. my name. They ask me all sorts of questions. They're curious about me. I like that. Like, this is really good. Even though they may not know anything about you yet. But if you take it as a long-term proposition, it's a marathon as opposed to a sprint. It doesn't make a difference. That's a short period of time. You'll be able to... to build that relationship in the future, month after month after month. And when you take that mentality, it gets rid of that anxiety. You go, yeah, okay, that's pretty good. I can do that. Uh, you think, know, I, I could take my ugliness that's a, away. That's a comprehensive plan for somebody to understand the whole networking element side of it. Do you find that, I, I, I guess that, uh, I guess this, this is a, this is a, a question probably that we've already touched on. You've already given an example of a limiting belief, but what are the common Mis limiting beliefs when it comes to marketing. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose there'd be a lot of people that are very self-conscious and they don't like that networking element side of it. And, and in essence is that, you know, Gary, I know that you're coming from a networking background, hence the reason with Kathy and Brenner and the provisors thing and all of that, all right. of that stuff. Right. I guess that, I guess that from there's networking as a limiting belief. What are some of the other common limiting beliefs that you see from any real industry? Authenticity. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> right? I need to be somebody else. Especially I was, like, was going to ask you this. I was going to ask you this because it you made me think about it. I don't know why with something that you were saying before is that you would, as a, as a coach and certainly on a marketing perspective as well, you'd get to see the two-faced monster. Okay. And, yeah. and what I mean by that is that I, I like, it, it's like that person, like if you and I are talking like this at the moment, then my phone ring and I'd be, I'd be like, I'd be like, hang on a second, Gary, 
hi there, it's Ben Brady. You know, like it's, it's like, the, it's like the, the totally different person. <laughs> yes, it, it's totally true. It's totally true. However, where do we see that most, Ben? Oh, I, I, I don't think I should answer that. Everywhere. In sales, anyway, mostly, in sales. Yeah, but mostly on social media. Oh, that's, sorry, you're 100% right. right? Like, how many times have you called it, you know, Instagram lives or Facebook lives? Like, they're only showing the beautiful aspect. Hey, I'm this. And they're doing videos that they're like, hi, I'm so, and then you meet them and they are a raging bitch. And you're like, whoa, that does not match. Let this me, at let me all. go one, let me go one further because I think yeah. I just want to indulge here for a second. Or the false humility. It's like, they've gone through something or that or something bad's happened, but they won't post about it until they've overcome it and they've learned something from it. And all of that, the, the false humility, humility drives me wild. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> do you, okay. This is also going a little off a tangent, but do you also love it when people say, start with a video that says, I don't know who needs to hear this. <laughs> oh, off like yeah. come on like really oh Tell really like, uh. what a crock of shit yeah yeah exactly it's such a crock of shit and you just go but here's the problem is um most people are petrified of their persona they're petrified of being themselves because they're afraid they're not going to be good enough they're afraid that people are going to judge them they're afraid that you know they won't hire them if they really knew who they were. <laughs> and um, and uh, quite frankly, I've done this before. I, I mean, I think everybody to a certain degree has done it where you're like, okay, I got to be buttoned up and I got to, uh, and then all of a sudden people are like, hey, you're that son of a bitch who swears all the time. And now you're not, you're, so, you're like, oh, uh, right. And oh, but you're so, but you're so right. Like, it? like I, that's, that's me. Like I, sometimes I'll drop an F-bomb or whatever it may be in a situation just to test the situation because, you know, it, it's amazing. And you see the people just relax. They're like, oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah. And especially they're like, okay, Ben can do it. We all can do it. Thank you for <laughs> giving us permission to throw the F-bomb out there. Yeah. Now, at the same time, if like it, when we're talking about language, if I am speaking to somebody and I do throw that up on and it doesn't land, even though, yes, that is part of my personality, but I'm not meaning to offend somebody. So I can relinquish that out. It's not like swearing is everything. That's my personal thing. It's not. It just, I don't have a, sometimes I don't have a very good filter. And so stuff flies out and you just, oh, like, Okay. But, but I do the same thing that you do where I test the waters and I throw that F-bomb out. And usually it's what you just said. Ah, oh, okay. You just gave me permission. All right. All right. Like, yeah, yeah. like um, you know, um, Kathy is in my um, provisors group that I run. And um, one of the um, last month, one of the gentlemen that was guesting there from Pasadena, he said, I've been in provisors for over 10 years and I've never been to a meeting like this ever before. And I'm like, Ooh, is that good? Is that bad? And he's like, I've never heard a group leader swear as much as you did in front of 60 people. You've got these 60 professionals that are all buttoned up and you are doing this. And, and I said, <laughs> and I said, well, do you want to hear my philosophy behind it? And he said, eh, please, like, well, you know, because nobody was offended. Like, he's like, how do you do it? And I go, here's how, I, here's why I do it. And here's how I do it. The reason why I do it is because I want people to be authentically themselves and I want them to have the permission. I'm in this, I'm in a family manner instead of standing up and saying, hello, my name is Gary Johnson. I'm with J2 Marketing and I hate my business. I hate me and I just want to sit down and, and they're like, oh, I want them to be vibrantly them, just authentically Or it's, or it's, them, the, or it's right? the other way, or it's the other way, Gary. You've been in a presentation before where somebody's like, like has got their their talking points and they, they're buttoned up and they walk this direction, they walk that direction. There's nothing out of place. There's there's no ums, there's no ahs. There's like, and it's like, oh dear, is this person a robot? Oh God, I feel uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. 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 And, and the other aspect is doing it to offend. There's nothing nefarious. There's no sexual connotations at all into it. it. It's none of that kind of stuff. It is just very lighthearted. And and I also, there's times that I get very passionate and it just comes out. I'll be like, oh my God, that fucking, oh, oh, yeah. okay. And then I just keep, you know, keep going. 
but people realize he's not trying to be offensive with his language. It's just coming out, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but going back to that authentic on social media, I find people are terrified of it. And that's a limiting belief because they feel like they're going to be found out. They feel like if somebody sees me with no makeup on, they're going to judge me and they're going to come after me and they're not going to use my services, especially in the real estate world. Because look, what, 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 what's synonymous with real estate? A beautiful picture that is perfect. They have the greatest headshots. I mean, I'm telling you, real estate agents have the, they, they've cornered that market of headshots. They're very great at it. It is just, it, and, and they look beautiful. And then, and then you come and see them and you're like, oh my God, I just got catfish. Like, where is that coming from? That was like from 20 <laughs> years ago. What are you doing? But they're, so we're true. so afraid of being authentic. And yet the, 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 the rub on this is the more authentic you are, the more business you'll get. Because you're going to attract those people that love you. You're going to attract the people that are like, hmm, I really like that. I re- other than his great accent, really good guy. Like, but he's authentically him. He makes mistakes like we all do. He screws up. He says a curse word every once in a while. But he's authentically himself. There is so much attraction to that that we just don't realize that. And, and that's when we're working on that foundation. That's where that limiting belief comes up because I'm like, wait, 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 wait. that's a really good point. Why are we not de- diving into that? And they're like, I don't want to be that vulnerable. That's good. And, uh-uh. and, and, and I get it. There are certain things that people don't want to be totally vulnerable. I get it. I totally get it. Like overshare. But there's sometimes that we do want to be vulnerable in certain aspects. And I will push them and say, what are you going to lose? And if it's image, then that's like, okay, we really need it. But if it's like, it's a deep wound inside of me that I don't want to bring out. Great. We'll, we're not going to touch it. Let's move that thing aside completely because this is not a therapy session, but we do want to pull those different things out. Like, you know, you had said, I work with attorneys. One of the things that connects me with a lot of attorneys is alcoholism because alcoholism is very prevalent with attorneys and, and, I'm a recovering alcoholic, so I can talk into that. But I'm very open. I'm very open about my alcoholism um, because if somebody else hears it and they're like, I want to have a conversation with him because I think he's open. You know, they think I'm open and I am, but then it might be able to help them. I want to add value to them in certain ways. Now, if somebody is an alcoholic, do I tell them, you got to get out there and tell everybody that you're, you know, a raging alcoholic? No, because <laughs> that is their thing. You know, AA is, is anonymous, right? And you don't want to out anybody in regards to that because that's their journey. But if somebody wants to be out there and they want to have that authenticity, it just resonates with people and they go, huh? wow, I, I get you a little bit better and I trust you even more so, um, which is what marketing is about is getting that trust. I think that that's fascinating. And, and Gary, if you're open to it towards the end of the episode, I'd love to talk a little bit about your journey with alcohol if you're open to that because it's something mm. that you know a lot of people, I think that if there's somebody listening that might be struggling and that you can maybe help them with the story of how you've overcome that, I think that that'd be ideal. But I do want sure. to stay on the real estate track and I want to come come down to, you know, just a couple of questions that, you know, you and I had spoken about before now that I think that, you know, that will really help our audience specifically. Um, First is what do you think that agents are not taking advantage of in the, in the marketing space when it comes to real estate? Okay. So I I think there are a couple of things. Um, One is building relationships with other professionals. I see them building relationships with their clients or their past clients, and they're doing really good, and friends and family. They don't translate that over to a professional network so that they're they're building a relationship with insurance people, with financial advisors, with with attorneys, um, and they're not broadening that that out. Um, And I think that it's it's a big disservice to themselves because they can find a lot of business because if you think about it, can anybody buy a piece of real estate? Yep, they totally can. However, what industries are typically um, do people, individuals, consumers go to that say, hey, do you know a good real estate agent? 
And it's tapping into those individuals that can tell you that, um, that can be like, oh, I've got a resource for you. Kathy and Brenda are phenomenal at what they do. Boop, here you go. Um, and here's the other thing is when you tap into a really good professional you know, uh, network, there are, they're, they spend a lot of money too. They make a lot of money too. They're high earners. And so they are also potential clients for themselves or for, for you. Um, so I think that is a, a big one. So to go along with that, if you're going after those, I think LinkedIn is the best social media platform for that. Bar none. That I think there's too many times that we go to the well-known. Instagram, TikTok, um, and, um, and Facebook. Um, and by the way, I liked what Lisa Copeland had said, one of your previous guests, where she's like, you'll never see me dancing ever, you know, um, which I appreciate that. But one of the things that I appreciate what you said about that was, do you think that those individuals who are watching it are making buying decisions for real estate? I think that is a question that most people don't ever ask. They just say, well, everybody else is doing it. And what they're not tapping into marketing wise is a target market because yeah. they don't have a target market. Their target market is typically either everybody or it's a neighborhood or it is a size property, right? Dollar amount. Yeah. I only handle 5 million and above right? Or I only handle this neighborhood. Now, I'm not saying that that is bad to handle that neighborhood because I think there is an enormous amount of value being the person to go to for that. But if you, if you can't have two, i.e. this neighborhood and then something else, how do you know where you're supposed to market to? Because I had a client of mine who said, I, wanna, I want you to make uh, TikTok videos for me because I was making a ton of LinkedIn videos for her. She goes, I want you to do TikTok videos. And I said, why? She goes, because I want to go after influencers. And I was like, I think it's a fantastic idea. And I'm not going to do it, but I think it's a fantastic idea. And I'm going to refer somebody over because I don't know how to do TikTok videos. She would be paying me a lot of money for something I'm not an expert at. And I really don't have any desire. I don't have TikTok. It's just not where my clients hang out. That's all. Yep. There's nothing yep. wrong with TikTok. But I was like, you're going after influencers, make TikTok videos. And I referred her into one of my good friends who does those. And it was like, boom, boom. And her business just took off. It was great. And, you know, can, can I ask, fantastic. can I ask a question? I want to ask a question on this specifically, because, you know, I think that one of the big strengths that I see that you're doing, and I, I love, I like outside of the marketing opportunities that you're creating for people, but I really do believe that if I look at the people that you've had influence on that I know, right, the networking element side of it, you are really great at getting people to understand that part of it. But what would you say to somebody that is listening to this podcast right now going, Gary, that's all good and well, but you know, like I don't know any networks where they don't have real estate agents already in there. Like, I, like there's already, they've already got their real estate person. Why would, it's too late for me to do that. Um, you know, all of these networks have real estate people in them. Like I'm not joining that country club because you know, at the end of the day, there's 50 real estate agents already in there. Like, what, yeah. what do you say to those people? Um, first, get over yourself. Uh, secondly <laughs> is... Uh, so oh, That's good. So, I like, so, no, we just stop it there. That's the end done. of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> so this is so common, especially, especially in real estate, more so than almost any other real estate or uh, than any other industry. And here's the thing is... <clears throat> When you build trust with human beings, even if they have their person, right? Their person handles certain things. There's always a gap. We all handle different aspects to it. So again, the target market, somebody might be, real estate agent might be young. And this, you know, I want somebody who is young. I want somebody who's driven. I want somebody who is going to pound the payment or I might want somebody who has been in the industry for 40 years, knows it inside and out. I want their breadth of information. They're both in real estate, but they're totally polar opposites. Now, is it typical we have total polar opposites? No, we don't. We're, we're usually somewhere in between, right? We have those similarities. And I say, if you have your own personal brand, you should not have to worry about what anybody else is doing. 
because what you're doing is you're making an impact on the relationships that you're building that are intentional. It's got to be intentional. It just hasn't, I'm all over the place. But when it's intentional, you start to build that relationship. What do you do? You build no like, and trust with these mm-hmm. individuals. Is that other person doing it? Maybe, maybe not. But if you're consistent with that and you do it on a regular basis, you kill it. Kathy and Brenna are a great example of this because there's a lot of real estate agents in provisors. Why are they killing it and the other ones aren't? Because you, you, I go to these different meetings and they're like, yeah, business sucks. It's awful. I'm dying. I might get out of the real estate agent or uh, get out of the real estate world. Da, 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 da. I'm like, hmm, why is it that this person is doing so poorly and they are crushing it? And I think it it goes down to one, Kathy and Brenna are very consistent. They are consistent. It's not like, oh, we're here one day and gone the next and here I one day and gone the next. They're very consistent, but they're also great at building relationships. Now, this also goes, Ben, towards introverts versus extroverts. Most people say in order to be a great networker, you have to be an introvert or you have to be an extrovert. You have to be very outgoing. And it's absolute polar opposite. In fact, the more introverted and shy you are, the better you will be at networking. As long as you can overcome your own you know, personal um, demons and yep. also if you are not socially awkward. Because if you're socially awkward and shy, it ain't going to work. It well, Gary, work. Gary, we're hoping, we're hoping to have you talk at our conference that's coming up here shortly. And uh, one of the keynote speakers <laughs> that we've got that's actually directly after you is that how not to uh, how to tame your social awkwardness. <laughs> 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 It'd be great for you to stick around for that one because I mean, you might be able to totally. teach them a few things. <laughs> oh, God, I love that. I love that because, like, I ha- I had um, a somebody who was referred over to me by somebody improvisers, and this person was improvisers. We're talking. And after 10 minutes, I said, I don't think we can work together. And he was like, why? I go, because in order for us to work together, I need to be brutally honest with you. And you need to be brutally honest with me. He said, what, what you think I'm, you you think I'm a liar? I said, no, I don't think you're a liar at all. I think I would be holding back from you. And he was like, why? I go, because some of the, some of the truth, I'm not trying to hurt you, but some of the truth is you're not going to like to hear. And it might hurt your feelings. It might, I don't know, but it might, because I don't know you well enough. And, and he was like, okay, well, since this is all gone and you're not going to work with me, what would you tell me? And I said, I would tell you to quit provisors. He's like, you're a group leader of provisors. Why would you ever do that? Don't you think provisors is great? I go, not for you. And he's like, why? <laughs> and I said, because you're socially awkward. And he's like, oh, shit. Well, oh, thanks. Uh, and I go, tell me this is the first time that you've ever heard that. And he's like, no, it's not. And I go, look. I would have you do totally different marketing strategies than networking. And I'm sure it's because, you know, your partners told you you need to go out networking to build your book of business. And I go, it's the worst mistake, isn't it? He goes, yeah, I've never been able to be in any business. I said, yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all because you're socially awkward. And he's an introvert. It's, it's a double, it's like, it's a horrible combination. And, and so it was like, he was like, all right, well, what would you tell me to do? And I go, I tell you to do LinkedIn and email. That's it. He's like, all right, let's work together. <laughs> He's like, you can't be more of an asshole than you just were. So let's go. And I was oh, like, it's all good. Right, let's, let's do this. You know, kind but, of. But but I think that I think that I think that Gary, what you're hitting on there is is some pure truth to somebody where. I'm sure that there's some people that have been close to him before that have told him that he's socially awkward or they've joked about it and it's been a little bit of a chuckle. You know, I've got a good friend of mine and I'm happy to name him because we all say it to him all the time. His name's Justin Green. He's socially, he is socially awkward and we all make a joke about it, but nobody's probably actually sat him down and gone, Hey mate, there's a reason that people get pissed off and they actually don't like you when you've done nothing wrong to them is because you are weird. In a yeah. social social situation. And, you know, there's a lot of people say to me all the time, oh, he's a, you know, he's a sharp guy. Like, why hasn't he done well in real estate? And sometimes you can't put your finger on it, but a lot of the time it's, yeah, socially <laughs> awkward. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and they uh, need but it's to the self-awareness because, and identity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes people say, you are, Gary, are my self-awareness. Because I call them out on their shit. I'm like, what is that? Like, what are you doing? Like, what is that? I I had somebody who posted this beautiful picture of themselves 
that had all the filters on. And let me tell you, she looked stunning. And I called her out on it. I'm like, what the is this kind of a post? What are you doing? She's like, what do you mean? You don't like it? I go, I hate it. She's like, why? And I go, because it doesn't look like you. It's like the best version ever of you. It's not authentically you. And she was like, "Uh, yeah, but it goes towards socially awkward too. Just the opposite. You're like, don't put yourself into situations where you're trying to build your book of business and you are making people very uncomfortable. It's not a recipe for success. And there's other ways that you can do it. And that's really where the consulting aspect comes into play is having a third party like myself that can see it. You know, I can rise above the day to day and go, boom, here, boom, here, boom, here, based on my experience and based on pulling out this stuff from them. And they go, thank you. Somebody actually sees me for who I am and how broken and fucked up I am. It doesn't make a difference and doesn't, well, I judge them, but doesn't, uh, doesn't actually hold them back, you know, kind of thing that actually helps make them so that they're powerful human beings and powerful in bringing in their own business. Because let's say, let's just be very blunt and honest. When you have more money and more business, you have more power, you've got more status, you've got more confidence. It's a great thing. Now, if you use it for nefarious things, that's when it goes off the rails. But when you have that financial freedom, that's a fantastic. We all want it. That's not a bad thing. You know, when it's used for bad now, that's a bad thing. Then in and of itself, let's get people to build their their businesses. Let's get people to really go after it. And that's one of the things that I applaud you on with your podcast is it's all about that. I mean, the whole thing is, how do you do this better? How do you do this better? I mean, I heard you guess and I'm like, the content that you have that is going is so valuable. And that's what you're doing. You're providing value to other people. And when you do that, that's the best marketing because people trust you. They don't go, what's Ben's alternative to this? Why yeah. is he you know, doing this? Why is he spending all this time to, to really, what's in it for him? Well, there is something in it for you because we all do things selfishly, but it's, it's typically a really good thing. I mean, it's really, especially when you're that's authentic. A- I think I think there's a really solid learning in that from an authentic perspective. They don't think that you've got ulterior motives. Mm-hmm. They, they're not wondering behind the scenes, like, is he a really good guy? Like, is he really yeah. doing this to help me really? Does he care about me or is he in it just for a buck? You know, like yeah. it's actually, if, you're, if your marketing's working, they've got a genuine trust factor the moment that you walk in the door or the moment that you meet them or whatever it ultimately is because you've put yourself out there. I think we've spoken about this on a number of episodes. I had a gentleman, his episode's not released just yet. It might be by the time yours is, Gary, but um, a gentleman down in San Diego where he's like, I've perfectly, like based on the content that I'm putting out there at the moment, I have people come up to me that are perfectly good strangers and just strike up this conversation. And in, in the beginning, he's like, in the beginning, he's like, it was weird as hell. Like I reacted pretty <laughs> poorly to it. But now I just, I now I know they're like, clearly listen to the podcast. They clearly obviously do a video call. And like, I have that within, within our networks as well. Like I have somebody come over to me and just start talking to me about random stuff. And in the beginning, I was like, I'm, uh, hi, I'm Ben. And it's like, it's like, it's like, no, 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 no. They've clearly watched some of the stuff that, you know, yeah. and, and I think that that's the true element of authentic or, or whatever it may be. I know that they've listened to stuff that I've done before. If they come up and they immediately start cussing, yeah. <laughs> they're like, they're like, they're like hey, Ben, how you fucking going? I'm like, oh, oh they not yet. Yeah, they've seen me. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, good. It, it, it's funny that you bring that up because I was talking to my wife yesterday about, hey, I'm going on this podcast and there's this Aussie that is uh, going to be on it. And, and she gave me this look and I'm like, <laughs> what? And she's like, don't say it. Don't say it. And it's a C word. Oh, yes. and, 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 the, and the reason why is because I personally think that Aussies, Kiwis and the Brits get away with saying that word. Nobody else can. Nobody can. And when somebody calls me that, if you call me that, I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if I call it's a you sign that, of endearment. Ooh. It is a sign of endearment in Australia that obviously you describe a good friend as a good 
that word, yes. you know, and 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 again, like yes. like it's we were speaking about this the other day in in a conversation. So in a, in in the office, we've got a couple of Aussies, and the Americans always sort of like they've got good dialect of what we say to each other now. Like they can follow along, and they're like, "You guys say some of the most offensive things," but now we've realised that if it's in a different if it's in a different tone. It doesn't mean any offense. Yep. <laughs> so, totally. so it's like, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Love it. But but going back to what you had said, because I thought it was brilliant, was people want to know what your intentions are. And when you're not being authentically yourself, it confuses people. Mm. What person am I getting? I.e., what's the motive? I, I, I don't think I'm, am I getting nice? Am I getting mean? Like, it, 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 the polished, not so polished, like who am I getting? And when I have to start thinking about that neurologically, I go away from those people because I don't know. And when I don't know, what do we do? We just, it, it, it's, it's like when things are really complex, but you can make it very simple and easy, people gravitate towards that. But when it's just too complex and they're not in this problem solving mindset, they walk away from it. But it's the same thing in regards to what are their intentions? Well, if you show up the same way all the time, people know what your intentions are. They're like, yeah, but he's saying that, but I think this is it. I think it. there's no misnomers whatsoever um, with that. Because again, you're authentically yourself. Plus, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to be somebody else. Because you're yeah. constantly thinking, oh shit, I'm, I'm meeting with Ben. What was I last time? Yeah, uh, what, exactly what, right. What, we're personality, right? Um, and that does not create trust in any way. It may create trust quickly. Like, okay, I'm in the moment and the person's like, oh, I really like this person, but it's not really them. That doesn't last because you're found out. You're eventually found out. And what most people are, they're found out very quickly. And that's not a good thing. Um, when they're not being authentically themselves. When they're authentically themselves, they're like, I'm good. I'm good. People see them and they go, I really like them. Like, he's just him. He is yeah. just him. I know what I'm getting every single time. So, and if I don't like him, that's actually okay too. Like when people don't like you, you're like, I'm not going to be everything to everybody. I'm not, some people are just not going to like me. I'm too nice. I'm too mean. I'm too whatever, right? They're just not going to like you. That is actually okay too. Because if we put our emotional energy into those people too, it is exhausting and it is just constant. Oh, am I doing the right thing? I don't know. I don't know. It's constant search Art. for approval. So, yes. so I think that I, I do, I, I want to make sure that I'm conscious of your time and the listener's time as well. And I, I do want to get back to the part that you mentioned that you'd had some, um, some problems with some alcoholism stuff. And, and again, yeah. I think that anybody that's had those type of experiences in life and, and I, I always want to make sure we try and bring them up on the podcast that if it helps one person, I think that it's done its job. Um, so yeah. Gary, if you're open to it, I'd love you to discuss your mm. journey with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, the short answer of my journey was um, I had I, I had begun drinking at a very early age. Um, you know, when I was an early teenager, um, I was drinking. And it was like, yeah, but it's high school. Yeah, but it's college. Yeah, but I am an aggressive business person right out of college, right? Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And um, one day... Um, God, when was this? Just over 11 years ago, I had a bender, like blowout bender. Um, and um, when I woke up in my garage on the ground, um, half naked, I was like, rut row, what did I do? Like, <sighs> you know, and um, and I, I blacked out and I was normally never a blackout drunk. Um, but then I um, started to look at, that day, um, I called in sick from work and I was like, okay, I got to figure out what's going on. I, I was drinking every single day. <clears throat> and, um, but I, I had this thing, and this is what a lot of alcoholics do, is that we put rules. I only had two drinks a night. I'm not an alcoholic. Oh, I like the balloons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't do any of that. So anyway, they bring it on. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, so so I only had two drinks. Now, let me tell you what my two drinks were. I'll show you. You see this? That was one drink. I consider this a drink. Now, my drink of choice was bourbon. 
I was a bourbon Drisky. So imagine two of those straight whiskey. I'm not an alcoholic though, because I only have two drinks a night, every yeah. single night, right? Um, yeah. And I love these balloons. This is fantastic. Yeah. I hope this is getting Sorry, get on the thing. I, don't, no, yeah, I love I, yeah. it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, so, so I then uh, called my pastor. I've got an issue. I don't know if I do, but I need some help. Um, do you know anybody who can help me? And he put me in contact with a gentleman that's in my church, and um, and the guy said, you know, let, let's meet for coffee. He heard my story. He said, I want you to go to a couple AA meetings with me to just see. And then he said, I want you to write a story about your alcoholism. Just write it out. Um, I just want you to just write the story. So I wrote the story out about how I was drinking. But here was the most fucked up thing out of the whole thing. He read it. He started laughing. And he gave it back to me. And he goes, okay, I want you to replace, oh, God, what was the word? Um, um, one of the words to love. And, um, and, and what it was is a love story. I had written a love story, a love story for alcohol. Like, oh, I love it when I, when I grab my drink and I got it and it's going to take all my worries away. And I love this and I love, it was all love around the alcohol. And he said, you definitely are an alcoholic. Congratulations. Now let's get to work, you know, and we did. I worked the 12 step program with him. I went to AA meetings on a regular basis for a year. Um, but at the end of a year, I told my sponsor, I do not want to go to any more AA meetings because for me, it made me want to drink. I was in these rooms, these people being very vulnerable and very deep and, and sharing just wisdoms of nugget or nuggets out there. And I just said, I want to drink every time I come to these things. And he said, don't make that mistake. I've heard it too many times. I go, I think I know myself well enough. And he goes, and that's another thing that they always say. And, and, but I just stuck to it. And one of the reasons why, Ben, is because my why, like, I was going to. Take a moment. Take a moment, Gary. I, I appreciate so, you sharing this. This is definitely helping others. So, um, When you come to uh, uh, what you call it, um, crossroads, your why needs to be very powerful. Your why needs to be like, why the f- am I not drinking? Like, why am I not drinking? If it's not powerful enough, you'll keep drinking. I used to go ninety days. Yeah, I'm gonna go ninety days, and what do I do? I do the blowout. But when you are going to, <laughs> when you're about to lose your your kids and your wife. You go, what the fuck am I doing? Like, really, what am I doing? And that is such a powerful thing. And I remind myself that all the time, all the time. I'm like, yeah, if I make this bad decision, this is going to happen. And it also, this is also something that really stuck to me is that I'm not responsible for my first thought. I am responsible for my second thought. Because my first thought, comes in some way from the subconscious from extra stuff that's going on and my first thought is you really need a drink right now but my second thought was if i do that what are going to be the consequences so therefore i wouldn't do it it was very easy for me it was simple because my why was so freaking powerful that i was like there's no way i'm going to do this why would i want to fuck up my kids why do i want to fuck up my wife no i love them like, no way. And so, so, you know, when your why is big, you get emotional on that shit, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't apologize for being emotional. It, it, you know, it's just, it just comes out and it just, it hits you. And you're like, like, there's times I can talk about this and you gonna be like, it's, it's a piece of cake, but there's other times it's not. And, and I'm only responsible for myself, I'm not responsible for anybody else. It enables me to actually drink with other people. I can go out drinking all day long. And I do, you know, people are like, you know, is it okay if I have a drink? I'm like, yeah, it's my issue, not yours. Mm. You're not mm. the alcohol. This is my issue. And you should not be curbing what you're doing for me. I appreciate you saying it, but please don't. I, I am good because my why is so strong. I would never, ever, ever touch it again. And I won't, you know, and that's what got me through after the one year was, 
my why has always been so strong. I mean, so strong. Um, and, um, and I just, I constantly come back to that and Hey, I'm not responsible for my first thought, but I am responsible for my second thought. And that enables me to take control over that, which over the thought, not over my life. Cause I don't have control. I think, I think life. that's, I think that, that, I think that is a complete gem out of this conversation one to see the emotion that you can put into that that you have around your why which has enabled you to you really overcome what is a, such a tough hurdle within your life but then ultimately that second thought element not being, not not responsible for the first but the second thought I think that's so valid. I think people are too hard on themselves because of the first thought entered their mind in the first place. But if you can manage yeah. to stop yourself and be aware enough to go, all right, here's my second. Uh, that that yep. uh, that's a There's that's power. a huge that's a huge takeaway there, Gary. Gary, I think that yeah. first of all, I want to say thank you so much for being able to share that with us. I think that 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 yeah. again helps as many people as we possibly can out there with anything that somebody might be going because uh, let's be honest okay is that yes attorneys are big drinkers but i think real estate agents are big drinkers as well like it's a big culture within what we do and it's everywhere um but then the other part about this that i've really taken out of today is the journey of what you take people through from a coaching perspective within their marketing business but it's it's not only the marketing's probably you know it's a hard word for this i think that it's i think that's just I don't know. There's there's a there's a bigger word that you take people through, and it's overcoming those limiting beliefs that I really do believe that you help most people with to get themselves out there. But the real label of today is that authenticity. I think the yes. authenticity that Amen. needs to go out there needs to be needs to be one needs to be needs to be something that we're all conscious of. So again, thank you for yeah. being on Rethink Real Estate. Oh, thank and- you for having me, Ben. I mean. I, I loved it. It was a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Um, and uh, I can't wait for us to uh, cross paths again. Um, Gary, so all of you your can contacts. call me the C word. Oh, mate, hey, trust me, the first drink we're having outside of this, I'm going to drop a couple of them on you, don't you worry. But uh, but realistically, all of Gary's information in the show notes, folks, you can get in touch with him all there. But again, thanks so much for being a guest on Rethink Real Estate, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. So about 75% of our audience hasn't liked, followed, or subscribed to our podcast. It would mean the world to us, and it would help this podcast more than you know to expand our reach if you were to like, follow, or subscribe on any of the platforms that you're watching or listening on. Thanks again.